So thank you. Kat, thank you very much for really setting up um, what I'm going to admit is a real shift in my consciousness. I'll come to that in a moment. Um, thanks to folks who've organized this uh, from our side, but also Infa Sound and Vision. And it's great to see so many friends in the, in the audience. A um, few words about Open Doc Lab and the co-creation studio. Basically, we are a research lab at a research university. Um, uh, but in fact, we're also a platform. And we're a platform that tries to bring together makers, scholars, creators, technologists, curators, and funders to really, to really think through the change that we're undergoing right now. Think through these new forms um, in immersive, participatory, interactive, and locative uh, documentary forms. So we're really a, a spider in the, in the middle of a pretty complex web, and uh, it's a wonderful place. We focus as much on the technological and creative side as we do on methodologies for understanding creation. And that's, that's the work that, that Kat leads and, um, at the uh, co-creation studio. Um, we have a lot of events. Keep an eye on our website if you're interested. I have spent about half my life in archives. Um, I cut my teeth as a historian of early cinema, uh, specialist on if it's before 1908, I know it. Um, chances are. Um, and I've done a lot on really early video systems and television systems. Everything, I, all my TV expertise is pre-war. So there's a, quite a bit of stuff there as well. And I really, I think I have a, embedded in me a feel like an, a, almost an archivist way of thinking. I mean, a real affection for the artifact and for the care and storage and accessibility of artifacts. Um, in film, one of the things I treasure in the domain that I work with is the quirk, the historical quirk, that what I look at exists thanks to paper, not celluloid. The copyright regime, before there was a copyright regime for film, at least in the US, uh, film was printed on paper. And it's thanks to those strips of paper that were able to reconstitute films uh, for which the nitrate has long since um, uh, gone, dissolved. Um, if I think of where we are today with the, with the digital, um, and it's the world I live in now, we have a really fast morphing technology, standards changing all the time, platforms, software changing all the time, companies taking over other companies and things you depend on like flash being wiped out in the process. We have abundance, a new condition of abundance, unlike the scarcity that I encountered with uh, in the archive with early film and early TV. Interactivity and contingency are conditions of these media forms. Rather than looking for the, you know, the release print version, there is none. I mean, there's, there's, there's nothing but a set of contingencies. There are interdependencies, which Kat spoke eloquently to. Interdependencies, uh, uh, both in terms of the technological ecosystem, but also just the myriad media forms that together as an ensemble constitute a particular project. And with all of that comes incredible vulnerability. Uh, as much as we like to think about the durability of the digital and lots of copies keep stuff safe. I mean, I'm a, a strong advocate of that, but that said, the ever-shifting uh, technological formats and standards are wreaking havoc. This will be a new dark ages for, for historians of the future. Um, three years ago, we convened a, um, a conference with Santrafi, Sound Division, Infa uh, in Montreal update or die, that was, I, I would say the composition of the audience was, was uh, somewhat um, archivist-centric and technologist-centric. It yielded really interesting data. Uh, it's a report I've been writing and writing and writing, and it should have been out. I was gonna hoping to launch it here. And I, I'll tell you what stopped me dead in my tracks. It was an event that we had three weeks ago at MIT with Kat, with Will Sylvester um, from uh, Question Bridge and with Oscar Raby, uh, VR uh, director, best known perhaps for Ascent, but a bunch of other great projects, Veritov. And the discussion that occurred there, and you heard some of it just now with Kat, really, really made me feel some, something like a mentality shift from thinking about all the kind of assemblage of techniques and best practices that we could talk about, um, to actually thinking in a more in a deeper way. And I just want to start off with like where the report, the report starts in a space that's very much about, you know, the what of preservation is always a key issue. And that usually boils down to like, well, it's a, it's a taste issue, which, which artifacts deserve this and what will we save? There's a different what, there's a different what, and it's just as important. What are we going to save? The hardware, the software, audiovisual assets and databases, 
um, user behaviors and responses. Because as, as Kat said, because so much of this is about process rather than product, the old what, the, the question of the what used to be kind of this, this, this vetting question, this curatorial question, and now it's something quite different. Which dimensions, what dimensions of a project will we save? And, and how can we imagine that? So, so what the report, as it was almost done, what that report was about were the things we learned from communities like the gamer community, where emulation is so important to how they preserve their artifacts. There's some best practices there, and there's a lot to be said about, about reenacting the dynamics of interaction and, and making old games accessible in new ways. From the digital art world, and also from our colleagues at the Tate, learned a lot about migration, about working, you know, ever newer versions morphing and moving across uh, across platforms. Rhizome has been doing such important work in this space, and their new their new tool is uh, Conifer is really terrific in that regard. Wonderful way to think. We we the report talks about uh, interpretation, walkthroughs, or in, in Bear seventy one's case, a sort of VR emulation. What do you do with at the end of Flash? You can reinvent and you can reinterpret. We had advocates of the idea of infinite storage. Moore's law is still holding, believe it or not, against the odds. So why not just store everything? Um, um, and we talked a lot about documentation. And documentation actually turned out to be really interesting because that's where you can, you can work with people from the front end of the project. You can build documentation into the creative process. And Think about what artifacts, what, what, what bits, what manifestations of a project uh, will survive the test of time. Um, so all this sort of makes a lot of sense and, and all of it can be sort of whipped into the, to the question Kat ended with, like let's think about the creative act of preservation. But actually, actually what happened after that talk three weeks ago with Kat and Oscar and Will is that I, I sort of had a shift and um, I think the digital has already, a lot of what I've said already manifests some signs of that shift. But really, if we think about this work, this past 20 years of interactivity, we're talking about pioneers. And a definitional part of being a pioneer is that you're in precarious space, dangerous terrain. You're out there as the first, the avant-garde in a technological sense. Much of what Kat uh, showed us was, was built on proprietary platforms, not yet mainstream stuff. And that's the case with most of the really new stuff. There aren't even genres or categories, technologically speaking, that we can point to. The trick in the art world, in the pioneer, pioneering world, is to invent new categories, is to break the boxes, is to push new frontiers. So that makes the organizational conceits of archivists very, you know, very fraught because these are precise, we're dealing here precisely with people that are trying to subvert that project. That's the newness they bring to the table in a pioneering sense. Secondly, there's performativity. And Oscar Raby spoke eloquently to these works as performative, situational, um, improvisational. Fluxus was the, the space he turned to, the art movement Fluxus, where you have a rule set and then let the performance go. And in this sense, I think it's really important that we learn from our colleagues in, in the performance arts, in theater and dance, where what's preserved there? And what could we preserve there? How do they preserve their work? There is something highly situational about a lot of these works. Um, and that's in part because a third P, they're participatory. Um, Participation is fundamental to these systems. Now, you could say that a movie requires an audience, and that's for sure, but in these cases, the textual form doesn't exist unless it's been navigated through by the user, whether it's in a 360 or a, 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 a real-time capture VR setting, or whether it's an interactive. Users have to navigate, they have to, have to activate, and in some cases, they even have to contribute. So participation is a really different dimension from the kind of artifacts like books and, and, and films and photographs that, that archivists are, uh, and users of archives like myself are far more familiar with. That sort of stability of the thing is not here in a participatory setting. And fourth, these are process centric. Again, as Kat spoke so eloquently, this is not about a product. This is not about an artifact, a thing you can put on a shelf. These are about processes that begin way before the thing that we tend to collect and, and, and revere and enjoy and show at festivals and continue afterwards. 
These are relationships with communities. These are ongoing endeavors. Um, so this larger dynamic doesn't really have a set of names yet or categories. Um, we can talk about it on a project by project basis. I can talk about hollow and how the deep work with the community in the years before what we know to be the, the thing that was like put out on the internet uh, appeared. And the thing that continued afterwards in the form of a community newspaper and outreach to the viewers, but we don't have good categories, conceptual categories or labels for that. And without those labels, we don't really have a handle to put on things and talk about preserving or saving them. Um, and finally, uh, uh, we have a last P, pluriformity. Uh, these are pluriform artifacts. They take many, myriad forms, as, as Kat just said. You know, uh, one millionth tower is also on the radio and it's also in subways and it's also in coding seminars. These are really, you know, as important as the, as the thing that we talk about as the interactive. How are we going to handle those? So I'm going to just stop here also, as Kat did with a question, and just say this for me is requiring a real rethink about how to make use of all these best practices that we've pulled in from different fields and really how to address that challenge of uh, the creative act of, uh, of preservation. I'm going to flip it over to Sarah Wallison, who directs our lab, and we'll talk about a docu-based project that's one way to go, not the, not the only way by, by any means. Sarah. Thanks, William, and thanks to IDFA and Sound and Vision for having this uh, talk today. It's been really made me think, too. I think all these talks we're starting to have about preservation is, is making us think anew about what we can do. Um, and William's uh, introduction is a wonderful uh, context for looking at DocuBase, which I'm now going to share the screen and talk to you about it. Hold on one second. All right, so this is DocuBase. And actually I was thinking back that we launched this originally at IDFA uh, six years ago in 2014. And it was supposed to be this, this you know, new database that is tracking the people and the projects and the technologies, transforming documentary in the digital age. But it was introducing people to this field because it was so new. And now today, here we are in a preservation <laughs> uh, you know, it's context that now it's also introducing and becoming a memory at the same time, which just goes to show how quickly this field moves and how quickly the uh, technologies emerge and disappear. And, and that's really the challenge of DocuBase is trying to document this very dynamic shifting field. Um, so we set it up by um, listing projects and I'm just gonna take you through quickly. Uh, here we go. Um, projects um, and we have metadata in each one um, and really this you know as we choose the projects in it it's really based on what the festivals are exhibiting and we look at what the field is holding up and it's not necessarily our particular you know curation although we curate within that context but it's really saying this is what the field is is holding up and, and showing as, as the work to, to be seen. Um, so this is a, a Fireflies, a Brownsville, it's a, a story of VR project. So um, we have one sentence just describing it. Then we always have the year, the people. We have this um, visit the project part. And that's important too, because we don't hold the materials on DocuBase. Of course, we're just a record. And we also, when we made this, we wanted to be a portal to, you know, uh, send people out into the field as a place to aggregate what's going on in the field, but then have people find out about things here and go visit them. So again, it was also really much about publishing and amplifying what was going on, not just, um, being a, a memory of it. Um, so we always had a quote from a, a maker and then a description. And in the description, we, we always try to say why we think this project is important and why we're, you know, it, it needs to be remembered. They all need to be remembered, but why we chose this one in particular. Um, the language, the country, the year, the 
author producer team. We had a, a big discussion about, you know, what team members, because when we started this, we were, you know, it was coming out of film and it wasn't about the editors and the cameraman. It was primarily at that point when we started on the web. And so we were looking at it from a web doc point of view. So developers and designers, um, you know, all the topics. And again, this was a uh, thought to be a place where you could go as a media maker or a scholar or a teacher and go look up projects based on a topic or a technology or a technique. Um, so if you wanted to work with DepthKit, you could come to DocuBase and look that up. And I'm going to actually show you now that filter um, right after we finish here. And then, of course, the funders. So um, that's how it's set up. And then you can go back to projects if you want to do a search. Um, we have a filter and we have these different topics here that you can look at. And for instance, you can go to technologies and look at all the 360 videos that uh, had been done. Um, and see if that works. Get 42 and you can go look at them. Um, and again, it was also, it's made, as I said before, for people to go in and see what's being done now. Um, but of course, now I realize that preservation is even more important. Um, when we had our conference in preservation uh, that William mentioned a few years ago, we didn't even talk about DocuBase. That sounds interesting. Um, playlists. So because it's a big field and William talked about abundance. There's so much. We thought we'd ask people, keep people in the field to take us through their favorite projects and, and why. So this is what this is. Um, we have a tool section. What are the newest technologies that are available to storytellers? Uh, and within it, you can go in there and you can find, um, you know, what company, whether it's open source or proprietary, the, type of technology, the inputs, the outputs, you know, what you need to put in this technology to use it and what it gives you and the skill level. And then of course you can go to the, the site itself to learn more about the tool. We've also added workshops because we realized just putting the tools out themselves isn't enough and that workshops to help people learn them is something. And then finally is the lab section, which is um, trying to document process. So we have case studies we did with where we interviewed people and gathered their process documents and put them in a case study, just straight up interviews, and then even some process documents. Um, you can see, uh, you know, we have uh, As Ascent from um, Oscar Robbie gave us all of his process documents and um, we have, you know, design documents and mood boards and such. So, um, that's another way to sort of try to document the process. Um, yeah, so these these are uh, the the is DocuBase, and I I'm going to go out of uh, the share screen um, and go back again to be able to choose a different one, which is this uh, slide, which I think you can see now. Um, so what are the challenges? I mean, I think DocuBase is a, a, you know, it's just documenting, but it's also reflecting the challenges in this field for preservation. So of course, we've talked about the unstable platforms. When we started this again, most of the projects were web-based. Um, so now we end up linking to projects where there's broken links. So a lot of the projects are no longer there. Um, and all, you know, all we can do is really say we, it was here, but we can't, we don't hold it. Um, the, uh, you know, emerging and inaccessible technologies, you know, we talk about the challenges of preservation with VR, but there's even, we're still dealing with the challenge of distribution with VR. So, um, you know, how do we, what do we do as a, a docubase, as a database, when you know that they're not going to see it? So we try to have trailers, and um, I've been thinking more, too, about what else we could have that might um, make it more accessible, like, you know, having artists write up instructions of what, what they want us to remember and know about the project. Um, 
emerging and shifting language. William talked about this. When you're trying to describe the project or we're trying to categorize things, um, the, the language and the terms are constantly shifting. And we want, you know, that adds to the search function where we want people to be able to find them. So we want to be able to use as many terms as possible um, to be able to uh, help people actually find them and not have them get lost in the database. Um, also, even within our own categorization, we have a, a label that's called festivals. Well, now a lot of these projects aren't showing just at festivals. They're showing at all these different types of exhibition spaces. And so how do we, um, you know, make sure we can include that. So we have to constantly change the categories that we're using. Um, and then as people have said, documenting interactivity, the participation, all of that, you know, it's something we're gonna start thinking about is how, how are we gonna document this, the, the sort of the soul of the project, which is not just the product, but the process and the participation and all the user interactivity. And maybe we're talking about working with IDFA to, you know, take some of these walkthroughs and put them on DocuBase. And finally, just sort of this realization that we are taking on this very important preservation role. And um, it's a challenge when, you know, you become the place where, you know, people can have to go if they want to find out about these works and, and that sometimes we're the only memory of them. It's a big responsibility and it takes a lot of funding. There's, you know, we could have five people working on this full time. Um, definitely there's a need. So those are the challenges and that's DocuBase. So thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, really great platform i've been following it for quite some time and it has evolved has been getting better so fingers crossed uh, we keep seeing more of that um maybe a question to you sarah is um how because you're relying quite a lot on makers i assume to get this information especially some of the technical information how difficult have you found it to approach creators and get them to collaborate to provide information um it's mixed, you know, it's sometimes uh, when we approach people, they're excited and honored. When just the other day, we asked a, a, a maker in Latin America to um, fill out the form. And he said, when I received your email, I was emotional. And I thought, wow, you know, wow. but, but people and you can go and search and people will say they're on DocuBase because there's so little documentation of these projects. People see it as a great opportunity to have their project remembered. So in that way, we, it's pretty easy, although then people are busy and getting it done. <laughs> we sometimes have to, you know, nudge them a little bit, but um, the general attitude is, yes, thank you, I want to put my project on here. Right. It, it sounds like, in a way, we're also trying to build a community that, could con that can sustain these kinds of projects. Is that something you've considered to maybe also open it up as a, almost like a Wikipedia type community thing where everyone adds information or is that not? Yeah, it? definitely. When we first started thinking about DocuBase, we talked a lot about that. Should it be a place where anyone can put their projects on? And I think um, it is an, a goal overall, but it, it's, you know, you have to curate that and have it be it's a different section. And I think, you know, there is a lot of curation that goes into putting these projects on DocuBase because as I said, there's so many terms and if you have to have some sort of unity in the terms you use or things just will get lost, it'll be one big mess. So curating it, making the projects accessible, even within DocuBase is something that takes, a, you know, someone yeah. really carefully going through them. Yeah, it, it, yeah. I'm having all these thoughts of like using uh, like a standard vocabulary for these technologies and stuff like that. But I could imagine that within this field, which is so like Will William described so well, um, is so much uh, avoiding and, and challenging all these categories. That's really difficult to find. But um, yeah, that would be interesting to see that evolve. Um, and maybe that's a question to William as well. We might get back to it in the, in the panel. But um, uh, do you think that it's maybe as simple as saying from an archival perspective that these interactive forms equal art? In an, so from an archive, archival perspective. 
or is there something that's unique about these documentary forms? Well, that's a good question. I mean, so I, I'm someone who sees, who thinks of documentary and art terms, but art has a lot of, uh, a lot of um, granularity, right? There's the kind of fine art world and there's the everyday art world, folk art world. I mean, there's a pretty broad spectrum there. What strikes me about these, um, so two things. What strikes me about documentary generally is that it's usually the canary in the coal mine. You know, it's the, it's the, it's the early heads up. It's the, if I look at the first uses of color in film, it's nonfiction. If I, the first uses of film in general is nonfiction. The first sound in Germany is uh, Walter Ruttmann's Melodie der Welt. In Russia, it's uh, Vertov's enthusiasm. Documentary is usually the thing that's out front testing the way. And then I think the, the, the art world, the pure art world and the fictional world, pick it up, pick up those techniques when they work, when they understand how they, how they operate and, and put them to work. So that always makes it a bit edgy and pioneering. Secondly, what strikes me about, especially this moment, is just how much documentary is intersecting with other communities, with, with performance art, with, with the visual arts, with audio art. There are established domains, and you can think of it as like a big set of a big uh, Venn diagram, and documentary is kind of at the center overlapping with them, but it makes standardization very difficult. It makes thinking about this as a medium as opposed to as a, as a mission or an act or a, a, a conceit, that's kind of tricky. So I think the, the richness of this moment in documentary is also its challenge because it's not just like, it used to be that documentary meant a piece of film or maybe a piece of video. And that's not where we are today. And maybe that's never where we've been, but for sure that's not where we are today. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks William.